So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. James Earl Carter Jr., known better as Jimmy Carter, was the 39th President of the United States, serving a single term in an era defined by hopes, tension, and growing crisis around the world. Born in Georgia on October 1st, 1924, old Jimmy didn't have quite the same illustrious background as many other presidents before him, living in a very humble southern family, coming from a long line of cotton farmers, and being the son of a local businessman and a nurse. Prior to his career as president, Jimmy held positions in the Navy and Senate, as well as being a successful peanut farmer for many years in between. By the 1970s, he had become the governor of Georgia, and after his four-year term, he put his eyes on the 1976 presidential campaign, which he would eventually win. Coming in with very little recognition and very low consideration of winning, Carter used those to help fuel a campaign in which he established himself as an outsider from D.C. Taking advantage of skepticism following Vietnam and the Watergate scandal, Carter's campaign of a fresh face was ready to do things differently, along with his wide appeal of Southern baptism mixed with social liberalism took over the campaign, and in the end, he beat President Ford by a margin of 51 to 48 percent. However, while he went into office as a hopeful outsider to Washington, D.C. politics, his presidency soon became marred with stumbling blocks and political problems, and we'll be looking at him across eight different categories to see just how well he stacks up on his presidential report card. You don't have to be a renowned military tactician to be president, but it is important to know when and where to engage in warfare, especially during Jimmy Carter's presidency. Carter was a non-conflict-oriented president and was reluctant to use force as a first option in any given situation. Even during the Iran hostage crisis, he did not seek a full frontal attack on Iran, but tried to minimize the violence of the not-so-seeker operation codenamed Eagle Claw. For most of his presidency, he sought diplomatic measures to resolve conflicts, as evidenced by the rather successful Second Salt Talks with Russia and his well-known work for mediating tensions between Egypt and Israel at the Camp David Peace Accord. Additionally, he pardoned those who evaded the draft of Americans into the Vietnam War, and overall his presidency gradually tried to reduce military spending and military influence of the U.S. around the rest of the world. However, this agenda was controversial, and even today, the debate on things such as the handling of Afghanistan is a big topic. He chose to fund insurgents over direct confrontation, and it became one of the most expensive covert operations ever, as well as possibly being the building blocks for later groups such as Al-Qaeda. While it's uncertain if other options could have been better, the effort in Af Afghanistan, dubbed Operation Cyclone, has been the common debate point for critics. Some of Carter's more concrete downfalls include the infamous failure of the 1980 hostage crisis. While it is one thing to abstain from the use of force to seek peaceful resolve, one must be able to effectively use it in the most dire situations when negotiation is not tangible and Americans are at risk, which Jimmy was unable to do. In the end, despite the fact that his failures often overshadowed his successes, Carter still made some advances towards a more peaceful government and he earned a D-minus for his work, although perhaps the force wasn't with him when he most needed it. Even though it's the government, not high school, the presidential race can still very much be a popularity contest. And when all is said and done, unlike high school class presidents, the President of the United States needs to remain popular not only amongst the people but also the press. A well-liked president is often viewed in favorable light even if his agenda accomplishments are less than impressive and can more easily pass legislation. While most of the population view Carter rather highly for his mix of Southern baptism and social liberalism, as well as being a fresh face amongst the scandals of Washington, that isn't to say that he didn't have his own share of controversy. Amongst them was the many crises, such as the 1980 Iranian hostage situation, that plagued his later presidency along with his minimal conflict agenda, causing many opponents to paint him as a coward and hapless. In addition, his own family and administration also had scandals. The Secretary of Treasury had to be fired for conducting illegal payoffs for a company he chaired, and his son, Billy Carter, received $250,000 from the Libyan government, which he had supported terrorism for undisclosed reasons. Carter himself, while a little stiff, was still mostly humble and honest, while various conflicts stunted his public support, especially towards the latter end of his presidency, earning him a B-. One of the major proponents of the Carter presidency that was heavily criticized was the strained relationship Jimmy had with Congress, which in turn severely limited his abilities of, as a legislative influence. The key factors that determine a good chief legislator is how well he influences and advocates for his agenda, and how well his relationship is with his actual legislators, Congress in this case. Having good relationships ensures a smooth flow of ideas and legislation allows the president to more accurately and freely pursue his agenda. In Carter's case, he had a good couple good things going for him, things such as a democratic congress, making it a unified government, and early popular support from the people. With those, he successfully made strong advances in areas such as environmental, health, and educational policy, as well as deregulation in areas such as airline, trucking, and rail industry. 
He also helped with the bailouts of corporations like Chrysler, promoted many so social and civil rights, and generally did his best to be persuasive and effective in Congress. However, as we talk about in Chief of Party, his relationship with the Democrats, especially towards the end, became strained, and this manifested in Congress as well. Despite the unified government, Carter did not have good relations with Congress, and his administration's desire to work against tradition as an outsider uh, soured relationships with members of even his own party. Amongst the many conflicts they had, one of the most notable was his desire to se uh, severely cut Port Carroll's spending and special interest funding he deemed wasteful, which Congress opposed. The two sides buttoned heads over this many times, with Congress rejecting Carter's proposals in areas such as labor reform and weakening his influence on legislation, and Carter vetoing items such as public work actors and pork spending. Eventually, when his public support dwindled, Congress took advantage and passed their special interest bills anyway, cementing the rather sour relationship and earning him a C-plus as chief, chief legislator. Similar to Carter's role as chief legislator, his role as executive was also a mixed bag, highlighted by conflicted viewpoints on his decisions. The chief executive primarily serves the responsibility of executing and administering laws and legislation, as well as secondary jobs such as appointment of judges and establishment of departments within the executive branch. In all honesty, Carter's role as chief executive was not particularly noteworthy in either good or bad. As stated before, he provoked strong environmental and educational policy, and his most notable achievements within the executive was the establishment of two new cabinet departments, the de Department of Energy and the Department of Education. Other things he used his power of the executive for include the pardoning of Vietnam draft dodgers, which received mixed response, as well as large-scale limitations to Iran and various economic and environmental regulations to help control the economic inflation and energy crisis that was present during the later half of his presidency. However, his desire for simpler style and disagreement on things such as pork spending displeased Congress, which limited aspects of his ex executive power. Interestingly enough, he is the only president to have served a full term and not make any appointments to the Supreme Court. Overall, his job as chief executive was, ex was executed, but not to any particular degree of amazement nor disappointment, earning him a solid B in the, this category. Jimmy was a real fat trimmer when it came to budgeting, holding a strong desire to change the way the Congress operated and trim down spending on pork and special interest projects. As guardian of the economy, it is the president's role to ensure general prosperity within the country, and he entered with broad goals to not only resolve the recession within the American economy, but also to try and make changes to wasteful spending in Congress. He even created a hit list of special interest projects he planned to veto immediately if he saw it on any bill, and did his best to regulate the excess spending in Congress. However, this resulted in the aforementioned bad relationships between Carter and uh, the rest of the legislative branch, and eventually many of the special interest bills were passed regardless. In other areas, he also pursued conservative economics, gradually decreasing military spending and attempting to propose various labor and price controls, although many were shot down by Congress. The beginning of his presidency was a slow recovery from recession, but the second half was highlighted by energy and economic crisis. To solve, the, uh, to solve America's energy problem, he passed the Emergency Natural Gas Act, which allowed the federal government to allocate interstate natural gas. Additionally, he deregulated domestic gas prices and created the Department of Energy to regulate existing energy supplies and conduct research for alter alternate and more efficient forms of energy. However, other problems such as his planned tax reform and federal deficit were never fully addressed, giving Carter an overall B- on his economic burden. Foreign policy was a roller coaster for Jimmy, featuring some of both his worst and best achievements as president. The chief diplomat serves as the gateway, the connection between the U.S. and other foreign nations, and while Jimmy opened some doorways, he also shut down others. He was a good host, and his most famous piece of diplomacy in office was when he helped mediate tensions between Egypt and Israel during the Camp David peace accords, greatly improving Jewish-Muslim relationships. Other successes include the second SALT talks with Russia, rekindling relations with China, and giving control of the Panama Canal back to Panama, although this was met with general opposition at the time. However, some of his less impressive works include the destruction of U.S.-Iran relations, very poor handling of the Iranian hostage situation, and lack of firm assistance of Afghanistan, choosing a non-combative, funding-based assistance rather than directly dealing with Soviets. And although the SALT talks helped U.S.-Soviet relationships, the rest was generally downhill, with large-scale embargoes as well as a very unpopular decision to boycott the 1980 Moscow Olympics. In the field of foreign policy, Jimmy gained some and lost some, so I give him a B- as chief diplomat. Chief of Party was perhaps one of his weakest areas. Although he did his best to uphold primary functions of the Chief of Party, such as supporting and campaigning for fellow party members, Carter's views on politics caused an undeniable rift within the Democratic Party between the, his more moderate views and those of the more liberal Democrats. Despite having a majority in Congress, his efforts to move more towards the middle for Democrats, as well as his refusal to play by traditional rules, led to a lot of conflict within his party, as we had mentioned earlier in legislation. 
the inability to gain substantial support despite the fact that he had held a unified government is very troublesome, his refusal on special interests in Port Maryland resulted in bad relations between him and many of his own party within Congress. Highlighting this lack of support was his failed 1980 re-election campaign, in which even during his own party's primary, which was almost an expected automatic nomination of the incumbent president, Jimmy Carter faced legitimate opposition in the form of Democrat Ted Kennedy. It showed the lack of support he had within his own party and earned him a very sorry d plus as chief of party. Perhaps the most important aspect of Carter's legacy, though, is his nuts. Much like the rest of his presidency, Jimmy Carter's nuts embodied the all-natural, new, and fresh American experience that he had carried into his initial run at the Oval Office. The job of a good peanut farmer is to create good peanuts, and President Carter's expertise and experience in the area, coupled with a strong desire and motivation to innovate, leaves him as the unrivaled top peanut farming president our great nation has ever had. In fact, if you look at it in the long term, Jimmy Carter probably ran a more successful peanut campaign than a presidential one. He inherited his father's farm, and even despite initial drought and poor harvest leaving him with only $150 worth of profit in the first year, Carter's determination and natural knack for study manifested in his crop cult cultivation, soon expanding and growing the business to be quite successful. Like all great things, though, Jimmy Carter's peanut career seemed to end much earlier than anyone had wanted, but perhaps the presidential calling was merely the whiskings of the peanut god signaling to Carter that his time had come. Many great peanut experts have spoken of rumors that Jimmy had pursued government uh, in hopes of advancing quantum peanuts to be used in theoretical sandwich making, but it's unknown what kind of advancements would have manifested if Carter had stayed in, on his peanut game. Regardless, the legacy he left behind in the peanut community is undeniable, and he earns a top grade of an A-plus on his position as Chief of Peanuts. In conclusion, Jimmy Carter, despite entering the office with high hopes and a new outlook on the government, ultimately didn't achieve his goals of breaking tradition in areas such as Congress and special interest funding, and left on relatively poor terms with both the public and his own party. While initially well liked and indeed having success in many areas of policy, but especially those of education and environment, the latter half of his presidency was filled with crisis, many of which was beyond his direct control. The decimate of his presidency is one of mixed results across all aspects, with major leeways in some areas, such as his improvement in Muslim and Jewish relations and his support for social and civil rights. But at the same time, his, his sometimes overly passive policy and intergovernmental conflict caused heavy controversy, as well as his decisions being indirect causes for future American conflicts, such as the war on terror. Although he was honest and hardworking, in the end he barely won his own party's nomination for a second term, and his presidency is often considered of middle to lower tier. In fact, his work afterwards, including diplomacy with countries and establishing for the Carter Center for Human Rights, which won him a Nobel Peace Prize, is often considered him even more influential than his work as a president. The final verdict is an A-plus for as a peanut farmer, but a C-plus 39th president.